I'm sorry, brother, I... You are no brother to me. Nor to Cleon the first, nor to any other Cleon who walked these polished floors. You are a deformity. And if I had my way, you would already be ash. Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to explain the ending of Foundation Season 1. The season just wrapped up with the release of Episode 10, The Leap, and it provided some answers to lingering questions while setting things up for the future of the series and Season 2. I'm going to look at what happened to Harry Seldon, what does it all mean for the Foundation, what happened to Azora and Brother Dawn and the conspiracy there, what will happen to the genetic dynasty in Demerzel, and what happened to Gale and Salvor Hardin. Just a quick spoiler warning, if you haven't watched the entire first season of Foundation on Apple TV+, Plus, including the ending, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Episode 9 ended with the death of Farah, in the midst of the conflict between the different factions of the Outer Reach taking place on Terminus. Harry Seldon emerged from the vault, and he seemed alright with what was happening. In the finale, we get a better understanding of how he came to be there, and what it all means for psychohistory in the Foundation. He's a projection, and he explains to Polly, who asked him if he was the ghost, that he took a pill that contained millions of self-replicating molecular machines. Those broke his body down inside the coffin that he had made, and it recycled that material, transforming into the vault on its way to Terminus. So the vault is actually made of him, but over those decades he wasn't awake, he wasn't sentient that whole time. He explains that his reawakening was triggered by the Anacreon's arrival. He says that it takes time to rebuild consciousness, and when Salvor tries to connect things to the Null Field expanding, he explains that it's just part of the Vault's natural defenses. Harry addresses the Anacreans and Thespans, saying that they've hated each other for so long that the origin of their feud is almost irrelevant. And he explains that the first clone, Cleon II, is responsible for setting things in motion. The generations of hate between these two cultures that we saw was ongoing in Episode 1 when they came to Trantor all traces back to what's called the First Betrayal, where Cleon II had his Shadow Master murder an Anacreon Grand Huntress and blame it on the Thespan King she just married. The point was that this marriage was going to bring together these two emerging powers in the Outer Reach and that would be a threat to the Empire's power. So the Emperor decided to undermine that, knowing that it would get them to fight each other, and then he wouldn't have to deal with it. Now Harry says he needs them to put that behind them and come together. He selected the original colonists on Terminus to have the seeds of a future civilization, and the others are survivors. They've been cast aside by the Empire and they're still there. Under the genetic dynasty, there's only room for one story and one voice, and he believes that that stagnation guarantees that the Empire will fall, and that will be followed by a dark age that lasts 30,000 years. It was always part of his plan for these three cultures in the Outer Reach to come together. He explains that he found the pattern in the jumps of the Invictus, and that their discovering it would be a potential step ahead for the Foundation's development. He explains that the idea of them curating knowledge for the Encyclopedia was only a cover story. The Foundation was never about that, it was about curating people. And when one of the Foundationers echoes what he says about them not being revolutionaries, he says that he may have lied about that point. There's still a problem in that the Empire is still going to come investigate what happened to Dorwin's ship, who was there in the first place to investigate what happened to the comms buoy. Harry tells them that they won't come if they think they're already dead, and he tells them to use the Invictus to create a false Mega Flare. Something like that would wipe out all life in the system, and therefore there would be no reason for them to come into a situation where there might be a dangerous star and a bunch of dead planets, even if it did host the Foundation at one time. After that, if they don't leave the Outer Reach, they would be invisible, and more importantly, they would be free. They can bide their time, build up their strength, and become what they need to be to shorten that period of darkness, according to psychohistory. As he gets ready to return to the vault, they ask if they'll see him again. He expects that to be the case, because this isn't the Foundation's first crisis, and it won't be the last. 
They bought themselves some time, but war with empire is inevitable. He tells them to remember this day, remember what they're striving for, and remember that a thousand years can seem like a long time, but it's only a blip on the history of civilization. And if they're not vigilant, this opportunity that they have could slip right through their fingers. As he was talking, he realized Gale wasn't there and that she never made it to Terminus. In that exchange, he meets Salvor, but it's clear that he didn't anticipate her or know who she was. So as he's leaving, she asks him about the visions that she's been having, and he doesn't know what she's talking about. She explains that she used them to help her solve the crisis, and he assures her that the visions didn't come from him, and then the projection goes back inside the vault, and it closes up, and it looks like it did beforehand. So what does it mean for the Foundation? We see that the cultures are willing to work together. There's an exchange where Rowan gives the Grand Huntress's bow to Salvor in an act of peace, and they plant a sapling from Anacreon together at the site of Farah's burial. Mari and the other Foundationers are angry, they feel betrayed, and it's not so much that Harry didn't tell them what was going to happen, but that he lied to them. Salvor's in a similar situation. She grew up thinking that the ghost was talking to her, that Harry Selden was talking to her through the vault. She started to believe that she was special, and now she has no idea where the visions were coming from. There's a time lapse of the colony growing over the next few months. Everyone has come together and they're taking Harry's words to heart, setting aside their hatred in favor of strength and moving forward with the Foundation. They repair the Invictus and Hugo becomes the captain. He goes out and generates the Mega Flare, allowing them to be free. And now that they have the technology, we learn that it'll take them about 18 months until they can start building new ships. For her crucial role in the crisis, Salvor is set to become the next mayor, but she has another vision where she sees a young Gale. She goes to see her mother, asking her about who the girl from the water planet was. This leads to the big reveal that Gale and Rach were her biological parents, and the visions were related to their memories rather than Harry. She knows that Gale escaped the slow ship in a cryopod, and decides that she needs to leave Terminus and go look for her. She decides she wants to leave right away because she's afraid that she'll change her mind, and her mother gives her her blessing and the Prime Radiant to take with her. She goes to the beggar, and Hugo finds her before she leaves. They have their goodbye, and we get an understanding of where her head's at. She thinks this is something that she needs to do alone. And when he asks where she's going, she just says that she has a hunch and she leaves. As has often been the case in this first season, where things get really interesting is on Trantor, and what happened to Azora, Brother Dawn, and the Conspiracy. Brother Day has returned to the planet, and his trip to the Maiden has changed his thinking. Brother Dusk wants to destroy Dawn and replace him. And when Day goes to talk to him, he says you're not one of us. Your DNA has been altered in a dozen ways. He wants to know how long he's known, and this brings about a really interesting conversation about how they aren't even really people, they're just echoes of the first Cleon, and hasn't Day himself ever wanted to leave this place, be something more than just an installment in this ongoing story. When he goes to speak with Azora, he explains that he understands that people hate him, but says that his detachment from them is what makes it possible for him to rule effectively. It's a strange burden not being able to carry a burden. The brothers care for each other, they love each other, and they shift that burden between each other. He views Dawn as his son, he rocked him as a baby, he cultivated him, and Azora took all of that away from him. So he wants to take away her legacy, and they located every person, family, friends, lovers, and so on, anyone that would remember her after she was gone. It's a total of 1,551 people. They have them all under surveillance, and there's a particle beam focused on their brainstem, so that when he gives the signal, they'll all be killed. And right after he explains this, he gives the signal, so they're all dead. He then tells her what her fate will be. She'll be put into automated extreme isolation, where she'll be sensory shrouded, but she'll still be aware. And he's doing that so that she can remember what she took from him. And it's a brutal fate no matter how you look at it. Demerzel comes to Dawn, she tells him it's time, and on their walk to the throne room, he says that she must hate him. She assures him that's not the case, she actually loves him. And when he says that it's only because she's programmed to, she explains that all love is programmed, biological or otherwise, saying that when a human mother looks at her child, their brainwaves synchronize. 
When he's brought before Dusk and Day, it's clear that Dusk hasn't changed his mind at all, but he has to default to the Middle Throne. Brother Day explains on his trip he had much time to reflect on their dynasty. He talks about the pilgrims he met who worked their whole lives just to walk a spiral of salt in hopes that they might be granted a vision before they die. He talks about the challenge from Halima. He brings up Harry Seldon, how he prophesies something similar, and declares that a bow incapable of bending will eventually break. He says it's time the dynasty bent just a little. Brother Dusk is not willing to go along with this and they start fighting. He's convinced that it'll ruin their dynasty and he threatens to decant another day rather than allowing the altered Dawn to live. As they continue to fight, Dawn goes to Demerzel for protection and she holds him like a child stroking his hair. Brother Dusk shouts, we are empire, history bends to us, and as he's saying that, Demerzel snaps Brother Dawn's neck, killing him instantly. When Brother Day protests, yelling no, she tells him that she's loyal to the Cleonic dynasty above all else. After he disintegrates the body, the Shadow Master comes to him to say that the rebels' plans to undermine the dynasty appear to be more extensive than they first believed. They thought the gene editing was limited entirely to Brother Dawn's person, and that it was done after he was incarnated, which is what the other clone told him whenever he was in the Scar. After more testing, though, they found out that the source itself was adulterated. As were the replacements, those are no longer pure copies. So the source material is gone, Brother Dawn is dead, and they can't replace him with another pure clone. Even Day himself could be altered, they don't know that yet, as well as Brother Dusk, who's being tested right at that moment. He sends the Shadow Master away, and in a rage, he smashes the glass case containing the original Cleon I. Then Demerzel goes back to her room, takes off her salt bracelet, and looks in the mirror. She looks troubled, she opens her kit, and grabs a tool before tossing it aside, and then tears her face off as she screams. And with a lot of unanswered questions about the future, the Trantor storyline ends there. So what happened with Gale and Salvor Hardin? Well, we get one last scene that takes place 138 years later. We see Gale arrive on Synax. She's able to find her home. There's no signs of life there anymore. Maybe not any on the planet at all, as we see that the water is much higher. As she's mourning, she sees a light under the water and decides to go find out what it is. It turns out to be the beggar, and inside she finds Salvor in a cryopod. She gets her out of the water and wakes her up, and when she asks her what happened, she explains that she crash-landed. She's been in cryosleep for more than a century and says that she was there looking for someone. Which, of course, she was looking for Gale, and she tells her, I'm Salvor Hardin, your daughter, and then she hands her the Prime Radiant, and the episode ends there. So in the end, where are we at? The Foundation survived the first crisis and came out of it with an alliance in the outer reach that will make them stronger. One version of Harry Seldon's consciousness exists inside the vault to be a reassuring presence at the very least. The initial reason he got the Encyclopedist Exiled Determinus was a lie, but things appear to be on course for the plan, and psychohistory should serve its purpose to shorten the dark age that will come after the fall of the Galactic Empire. Periodic crises are baked into that, and Harry should re-emerge accordingly. Gale and Salvor are mother and daughter, and they have these unique abilities they don't quite understand. They're together, but their future is uncertain. Considering they have the Prime Radiant, I have some ideas based on what I know from reading the books, but I won't go into those here. Their being on Synax means that they're somewhat isolated, but considering the Foundation has at least one jump ship now, they could be reconnected without another prolonged period of cryosleep. Either way, enough time has passed that things are completely different on Terminus, and it's going to take time for that story to catch up to where they're at. The Cleonic Dynasty also has an uncertain future. The only thing that seems certain is that it won't be carrying on like it has for the last 400 years. They left things pretty wide open as far as whether Brother Dusk and Brother Day were altered, and there really wasn't any progress as far as finding out who's behind the conspiracy. 
Demerzel's final scene was fascinating, and I think one of my next videos will be talking about what I think's going on there. For now, it appears that Cleon the First altered her programming to be loyal to the Cleonic dynasty above all else, and the things that she has to do in relation to that are taking a toll on her. It'll be interesting to see how she responds to the dilemma of having no new clones or pure genetic material to continue the dynasty as they've known it. For a review, this first season had its issues, especially in the structure and pacing of the early middle episodes. Overall, the Terminus storyline was noticeably weaker than the story with the Cleons, and there were places where it just didn't work for me. I'm sure some of that can be chalked up to the pandemic, but it also felt to me that they defaulted to try to do a cool action thing in a lot of situations with mixed results. I do give them credit for the effort though. Looking back, they did a lot of crazy things, and I think generally speaking, it's always good to see a show that takes chances, and I'm hoping that they'll be able to identify what worked and what didn't, and come back with a much stronger effort in the second season. There was a lot of effort to develop the characters, and again, I think this worked a whole lot better on the Trantor side of things. But as far as the finale's concerned, it felt like a step up across the board in that department. So at least it feels like they're going in the right direction there, even with having so many different stories that all felt somewhat different to tie up in one hour-long episode. From Asimov, they've got a toolbox to pull from that includes some great twists and turns based on psychohistory. And the part they introduced themselves, the genetic dynasty, has turned out to be a great addition. They managed to pull off some great sci-fi and character stuff at the same time. There's so much rolled up in that dynamic, and I love the progression of Brother Day through his trip, then coming back to his interactions with Dusk and Dawn and Azora, respectively, only to be completely in invested in what was going on in his decision, and then actually shocked at what Demerzel did. The thought of Brother Day being on the verge of changing things, only to have it snatched away by a failsafe that we have to assume was instituted by the original Cleon, that was the highlight of the season. The most powerful person in the galaxy is trapped in that cycle, there's really nothing they can do to change things, and now there's no way to continue that. So even with the issues it had, I'm pretty happy with where we're at. I'm curious to see where they go from here, and I'm glad I watched it and I'm happy that they made it. It was ambitious and sprawling and you can't take that away from it. This thing was huge, in scope and budget. It was a proper spectacle at times, and there's a lot to like there if you go looking for it. And I think that's a good place to leave things. I do have a lot of questions though, and I'll be following this up with a season two questions video sometime during this week. So let me know what questions you have for that in the comments. And let me know what you thought of the season, what you thought of the finale. And if you want to talk book spoilers, just make sure you mark them. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.